Chapter 6. Unplanned Departure In late August 1941, Rommel decided to capture the fortress of Tobruk, which was still occupied by the British and stuck like a thorn in our side, once and for all. The British had built up the city's defences further and even managed to reinforce it by sea with men and materiel despite fierce German air attacks. So, starting in early September, Rommel tried to tighten the noose around Tobruk. His headquarters were relocated to Gazala, to the west of Tobruk, and commenced preparations for the assault. Since attacking from Halfaya Pass eastwards toward Cairo was not feasible, then at least the important harbour of Tobruk was to be captured. Rommel had used all arriving supplies to continually reinforce active combat formations. Consequently, the 5 Leichter Division was transformed into the 21 Panzer Division in August. This division was to decide my fate over the course of the war, with the 15 Pezdiv as well as the 21. Pezdiv, Rommel had two full armoured divisions in addition to the Italian ones in the African theatre of war by late summer 1941. He seemed to have enough forces available to dare the risky attack. In mid-September, during the preparations for this offensive, our detachment was ordered to hand over our positions to other units in order to support the planned attack. Our journey led us to the east of Tobruk. We were happy to notice that this was once again close to the sea. Here we took up positions between the coast and Via Balbia. If the assault on Tobruk was to be successful, the British were expected to attempt a breakout towards the east, which would make them run into our anti-tank gunfire, leading to their ultimate destruction. First Lieutenant Maida took care to survey our planned positions with appropriate diligence. The companies quickly dug in, and 88mm flak guns were also deployed in our area once again. Something that benefited us during the build-up of our positions there was the fact that we had absolute air supremacy. Unlike around Solemn and Halfaya Pass, we did not have to watch out for British fighter and fighter bomber planes. On the contrary, we could witness our Stukas drop bombs on Tobruk almost all day long. For us on the ground, such a dive bomber attack was always a sight to behold. When the Tobruk perimeter had been tightened, the area we later deployed to had seen intense fighting. I discovered multiple provisional graves, but also something just as gruesome. A few of the graves had been scavenged by jackals. Because of the hard ground, the graves were quite shallow, so they were covered with piles of rock to keep the carrion feeders from consuming the dead. Those carrion feeders were really tenacious, however, digging through to the remains. Time and again these desert jackals were roving about near the graves, trying to reach the decomposing corpses, scratching and scraping. The rocky terrain offered them plenty of hiding spots. On their search for something to eat, they would daringly sneak up on us, only driven off by having rocks thrown at them. Most unnerving, however, was their typical howling at night. On guard duty at night, this could become quite annoying. I was no exception to this, and during these lonely nights I thought with consternation about the graves of the Phelan, who could not find peace even in death. Already during the transfer from Solemn to the Tobruk area, I noticed that something was wrong with me. The usual exhaustion had intensified for me. I was even more tired than usual, and now, at the Tobruk front line, the first attacks of fever and diarrhoea were coming. My fever got worse and worse, eventually rising to 40 degrees centigrade, 104 degrees. I was just barely able to stand, and so our medic decided to have me admitted to the hospital. High fever, abdominal pain and diarrhoea led him to suspect typhoid fever. In addition, I showed clear signs of jaundice. When he informed me of his decision, I was shocked. I didn't want to leave my comrades and go into the uncertainty of a military hospital stay. This typhoid disease, a kind of bacterial infection, I only knew from hearsay. Now I was to have it. However, our medic was convinced and described what drastic consequences an outbreak of the disease in our unit could have, and so, totally exhausted as I was, I surrendered to my fate. Southwards of Tobruk, near Al Adam, there was a large field hospital of the German Africa Corps, where I was brought to in the medical vehicle. Upon taking a brief look at me, 
the doctors did not hesitate to confirm our paramedics' suspicions. The field hospital, however, was already above its capacities. My condition did not improve notably at al Adem, and the attacks of fever and stomach cramps took a heavy toll on me. In contrast to how I had earlier objected to leaving the front line, I was now so exhausted and suffering that I was wishing to get better from the bottom of my heart. Nothing else mattered to me, with a high fever and intense stomach cramps. I lay on a cot, hoping for my condition to change. Eventually I was moved from al Adem to a hospital at Derna, where the Africa Corps had stationed a special disease control unit shortly before. This had proved to be necessary after casualties from infectious diseases had risen dramatically over the past months. I have barely any recollections about the journey to Derna. The hospital was overcrowded with sick German and Italian soldiers, some of which were in comparably bad shape as myself. As such, I was quickly sent off again. A Junkers Ju-52 transport plane carried me to Crete, and from there to Athens. The only thing I remember about these flights were the giant red crosses painted on the airplane's sides, which I perceived during the embarkation. On top of my exhaustion, the engines of Auntie Ju droned so soothingly that I fell asleep almost immediately. After more than four months of deployment in Africa, I now left the continent. In hindsight, I can say that leaving the North African Theatre of Operations on November 8, 1941, was a lucky coincidence for me, as the following months saw heavy fighting. On both sides thousands of men lost their lives. Until early November 1941, Tobruk was fiercely besieged by German and Italian troops. Then came the big surprise, which the Germans had not seen coming. On November 18th, the British commenced Operation Crusader. After the last operation in June had failed, there had been a change of leadership among the Commonwealth forces. General Archibald Wavell, who had not been able to defeat Rommel, was replaced by General Claude Auchinleck. After months of preparation, he initiated a counter-offensive. Rommel's plans to attack Tobruk had become known to the British, as decoding the German Africa Corps' radio messages had resulted in effective intelligence. Operation Crusader was a success, and the forces defending Tobruk even managed to mount a breakout attempt. This attempt, however, ended in a disaster for the British, as they lost 113 of 141 tanks committed to the action. Our anti-tank efforts had brought great success, with our 88mm flak guns contributing in no small measure. The British forces advancing from Egypt pressured Rommel more and more, however, and after a series of engagements inside the Libyan desert, the prevalence of supplies as well as the concentration of force eventually decided the battle. Rommel, who was caught red-handed after initially believing the offensive to be just a reconnaissance in force, had to withdraw. The siege of Tobruk was lifted by the British in mid-December 1941, and only in late December 1941 the German Africa Corps was able to form a defensive line near El Agela, right where Rommel's successful advance had begun in March. The front line was now back where it had been eight months ago. During the fighting in November 1941, German and Italian Axis troops lost almost 33,000 men in total, whereas the British lost around 18,000 soldiers. German units encircled at Solom and Halfaya Pass held on until January 17, 1942. Then they had to capitulate as well. By December 1941, the British were convinced that Rommel had been put in his place once and for all. Just like after their success against the Italians in February, they began pulling their troops out of the theatre. Rommel, however, kept receiving supplies and reinforcements, initiating another surprising offensive on January 21, 1942. Surprising indeed, as neither the British nor German OKH had anticipated it. One more anecdote regarding my first deployment to Africa in 1941. In the spring of 1942, after my return from Africa, the Italians awarded me, among many thousands of German soldiers, the German-Italian Campaign Medal, Deutsche Italienische Feldzugsmedaille, to honour my commitment. On one side, this medal featured two gladiators, symbolising Italy and Germany, who together fought a crocodile, symbolising the UK. 
The other side featured a depiction of the Arco dei Fileni, the Italian triumphal arch located in the Libyan desert. I would wear this decoration next to my Africa Corps uniform stripe from then on. When Italy renounced her alliance with the German Reich in 1943, Wehrmacht soldiers were prohibited from wearing Italian decorations. The two nations' brotherhood in arms had not endured for long. As for me, I kept wearing the medal in 1944 during my deployment in France, in remembrance of my Italian comrades, who I kept in good memory in defiance of all later events. Chapter 7. Officers' Training The rapidly growing number of Wehrmacht divisions led to an ever-increasing demand for commanding officers on all levels of command. Thus, the officer corps underwent an unprecedented multiplication of its numbers. In order to not water down the quality of future leaders, the corps' training regime was adapted multiple times between 1933 and 1945. Until the end of 1942, when I was withdrawn from the front line, the ideal officer's career looked as follows. A basic requirement for officer training was being eligible for university training, although this was dropped later in the war. After six months of training in the reserve forces followed by three months of frontline duty, the cadets would return to the officers' academy for three further months, then two to four months at the front again, after which they were promoted to full-fledged officers. The whole system was designed to produce battle-proven leaders instead of theoreticians. Service at the front was simply regarded at the best mentor. Before I was to become an officer myself, however, I needed to recover to full health. Once in Athens, I was first put in quarantine for 14 days. During this time, the fever attacks became weaker and weaker, and my general condition improved considerably. After thorough examination, the doctors decided to dismiss me and send me back to Germany. I received my travel orders and began the journey, accompanied by an NCO who had the same destination. Only after a bumpy truck ride that brought us to Lamia were we able to board the train to Belgrade. From there we went through Vienna and further into Germany. Once in Germany I realised that quite a lot had changed while I had been away. My old unit, Panzerjäger Ersatzabteilung 33, had moved from Ludwigshafen to Landau in the Palatinate, which was 50 kilometres, 30 miles, further southeast. Right after arriving at the Landau barracks, I received notice that I was reallocated to Schützen Ersatz Bataillon 104, 104th Reserve Rifle Battalion, which provided replacements for Panzergrenadier Regiment 104, 104th Mechanized Infantry Regiment of the 15th Panzer Division. My sergeant major had great news for me. I was to go on sick leave at home, so I packed up my belongings again, boarded another train, and commenced the journey back home to my loved ones. Thus, I spent the days between December 11, 1941 and January 8, 1942 at home. My parents saw to aiding in my recovery, and my dear Helena excitedly welcomed her repatriate. What I was especially happy about was the privilege of spending Christmas at home. The weeks went by quickly, and before I knew it, I was with my unit at Landau again. The winter there was harsh, and snow piled up over a metre, three ft high. I quickly resumed everyday life at the barracks. Measures needed to be taken to further my officer training, which resulted in me being posted for basic training duty. After a few weeks in Landau, I also spotted a very familiar face on the barracks grounds, First Lieutenant Maida. Once we had recognised each other, we cordially shook hands. Maida told me about the heavy fighting which our unit had had to endure in November 1941. The positions at Halfaya Pass and around Solom had been enveloped by the British and the units there had eventually capitulated. We both agreed that we had been lucky to have been redeployed to Tobruk. Maida was quite surprised to find me here and made a promise to help forward my officer training. Almost immediately, I was assigned to a class of reserve officer candidates a course ahead of actual officers' training in order to specialise into a distinct services branch. This served as preparation for me attending the Panzertruppenschule, Tank Forces Academy, in Wunsdorf. If needed, course participants could also be posted for basic training duty.
Both regular lessons as well as training duty mostly happened at the Schwetzingen Parade Grounds, a military training area, which I already knew from my own basic training, including some of its weapon inventory. Among other things, we trained recruits in handling the Park 38 50 mm AT gun, which I was quite familiar with. But there was also a gun which was new for me, the 75 mm Park 40. This was, in essence, a derivative of the Park 38. Thanks to its larger calibre of 7.5 cm, 2.95 inch, it could effectively combat the Soviet T-34 and KV-1 tank models which had emerged on the Russian front, causing a lot of trouble for the German troops. With the old tank knocking device, they had been powerless, but this new 75mm Puck 40 was able to disable these modern tanks even at a greater distance. What was special about our guns was that they had already been mounted on a self-propelled chassis, some obsolete tank bodies had been modified with a mounting which accepted the Puck 40 guns. In our case, a Panzerkampfwagen II Mark II tank body had been used. This type had seen combat in Poland and France during the early war and by now was helplessly obsolete. By installing a 75mm AT gun, it was hoped to produce a capable tank destroyer. First, the old superstructure had been removed which was then replaced with a gun mounting that could be adjusted horizontally and vertically, with the 75mm gun surrounded by some 15mm and 0.6 in of steel plating. This formed a fighting compartment, which remained open to the rear and top sides, thus offering little protection against shrapnel or direct fire coming from those directions. The chassis front was not well armoured either, having around 30mm 1.2 in. This, however, in conjunction with tank tracks, provided excellent mobility and made for an anti-tank weapon capable of rapid redeployment. As such, it could be used to quickly create anti-tank bulwarks at threatened front-line sectors or following an enemy armour breakthrough. An important capability if we wanted to combat dreaded enemy tank formations, especially in the far reaches of Russia. In addition, it was possible to rapidly shift to an alternate position after firing. The newly constructed vehicle was termed Sonderkraftfahrzeug 131, Stikefz 131, Special Purpose Vehicle, or simply Marder 2. With its 140 horsepower engine, this Martin Mark II reached a road speed of 45 kp 28 mefeitmej and still as much as 19 kph 12 mg cross country. After one more month of training duty, I was eventually promoted to sergeant on April 1st, 1942. From then on, things moved rapidly. A few weeks later, during May, I was sent on vacation, special leave, that is, due to my upcoming reassignment to officer school at Winsdorf. This special leave lasted from May 22nd to May 27th, just six days. Naturally, I wanted to spend that time at home, so I boarded another train. This time I returned much more proud, I was a sergeant now, after all, and not a simple rifleman anymore. I favourably noticed how the lower-ranking men were now saluting me with a lot of respect. My Africa Corps armband also generated quite a lot of admiration. By the end of May, my officer training at Panzertruppenschule the Fur, First Panzer Forces Academy in Wunsdorf, had commenced. This school, also called Schule für Schneller Truppen der Fürs, First Rapid Forces Academy, was located 50 kilometers, 30 kilometers me, south of Berlin. Training of German Wehrmacht officers on a low level, meaning lieutenants, followed a simple tenet, lead from the front. At every point, be it in the lecture room during tactics lessons or while commanding men in the field, we were drilled to be forward near our men and stand our ground in battle. This was the best way to stay on top of things and make the right decisions without delay. Furthermore, one was to lead by mission instead of leading by orders. This granted more freedom in execution, which meant for us the given objective was to be achieved, but how you achieved it was completely up to you. And, since you were at the front during combat, you lived in the situation and could thus make the right decisions quickly. Inflexible orders from the rear would hardly ever allow for that. In short, we were taught what to do, 
but had the freedom to decide how to do it. In addition to our theoretical and practical lessons in leadership, there were courses regarding military knowledge, for example, lectures about education and military science, about military law and the composition of the German Wehrmacht. German history, too, was not left out and was a fixed part of the agenda. Furthermore, we were taught the duties of the German soldier as well as rules for work and life. A brief excerpt of these professional standards reads as follows. Always be a role model, especially in times of crisis. Before you start giving orders, have a good look at your men and try to recognize the person they are inside. Knowing people is prerequisite to treating people correctly. Orders only make sense if they are convincing. Always act with reason and heart when you are responsible for human lives, especially in war. Uphold until your last breath the faith in the greater German idea and in God. This faith also lends inner strength, especially in crises of life and during war, when human strength is often tested. An age as grand as ours is only mastered with unwavering faith. Furthermore, we received Wehrmacht High Command's Mitteilungen für die Truppe, messages for the troops. These pamphlets were distributed among Wehrmacht ranks down to company level and were also handed to us. With articles such as How Roosevelt Deliberately Steered Towards War or Lies, Deception, Terror, Weapons of British Politics. It was made sure that we knew how nobody but us and our soldiers were fighting for the right cause, not our enemies. We were raised and instructed to represent the future elite of the German Wehrmacht. Our lecturers never tired of repeating this sentiment. What counted for us were the here and now, to prove ourselves as capable commanders and the victories we wanted to achieve on the battlefield. Today, much of this may be hard to relate to for the reader. We were indoctrinated into hardly ever asking questions. Questions were asked only while directly confronted by the horrors of war just like I had experienced in Africa. Behind the front lines, one tended to get worked up into feeling invincible again. This would change for me only over the course of my later deployments, where, in the face of suffering and death, I would start to question situations and orders. September 30th, 1942 was the day before our graduation from Panzer Troops Academy and promotion to Lieutenant. On that occasion, we were allowed to witness an extraordinary event. All available academy personnel, along with us cadets, were taken to the Reichsporthalle, Berlin Olympic Stadium. There we were to attend a speech by the Führer. Early in the morning, we jumped on trucks that took us to Berlin. A huge crowd of people in uniform was already there, moving onto their allocated seats in an orderly fashion, despite their great number. Thousands upon thousands of Wehrmacht and party personnel gathered to listen to the Führer of the German Reich. As soon as we all had found our seats amidst the vast crowd, Adolf Hitler entered the stage. Ineffable cheering broke out, everyone stood up and kept shouting, Sieg Heil! The whole crowd billowed in excitement. The atmosphere was beyond comprehension. The German Reich was at the height of its power. France was occupied or allied to us. Great Britain had been put in its place. We were in possession of the high north. In Russia, our armies had advanced up to Leningrad, Stalingrad and the Caucasus. The entire Balkans were occupied, while in North Africa we were standing at the border to Egypt. The world trembled before the German people and its Wehrmacht. With the speech that was to follow, Hitler made us feel all that. He spoke about the opening of the eastern regions, how the general supply and food situation would improve for all fellow Germans. Hitler was of the opinion that the next year would bring the deciding victory, and we all believed him. On the next day, the time had finally come. I was promoted to lieutenant and became reserve officer of the German Wehrmacht. All of us mustered at the academy to receive their rank insignia, and our commander gave a rousing speech wishing us all the best for our frontline deployments. This we would be needing for sure, as the life expectancy of a young lieutenant was on average around seven days of frontline service, not more than a week. A company commander already had an expectancy of 14 days, while a battalion commander even made it to 30 days on average. Of course, we were never officially told these numbers, and I would come to know them only after the war, 
However, rumours of a short lifespan for lieutenants never ceased to circulate within our ranks. Well, all of us assumed that this would not be the case for themselves. For me, there was just one thing. I wanted to get back to the front, if again in Africa, then all the better. Since my departure from there, a lot had happened. In an initial offensive starting in January 1942, the German Africa Corps had managed to advance as far as Gazala and El Adam near Tobruk until the end of May. In June, the German-Italian joint operation Theseus marked the beginning of large-scale attacks on Tobruk itself. Two weeks later, the defence perimeter had been breached and Rommel's forces stood inside the town. In total, around 32,000 Allied soldiers became German POWs, with the Africa Corps capturing roughly 10,000 tonnes of fuel and 5,000 tonnes of other supplies. Rommel was rewarded immediately. Hitler promoted him to the rank of General Field Marshal. German newsreels were full of joyful reports about this success. As for the Desert Fox himself, he kept on pushing forward even though his forces were somewhat weakened after having captured Tobruk. He chased the retreating Commonwealth forces until they committed to battle again in July 1942 near El Alamein. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill now demanded that General Auchinleck conduct a counter-offensive just like Rommel would have done, but Auchinleck refused. Consequently, he was relieved from command on Churchill's orders and replaced by General Montgomery, who took over the British Eighth Army with one clear goal, to banish Rommel and his forces from Africa once and for all. Montgomery kept bolstering up his forces over the months that followed until his superiority was guaranteed. Finally, on October 23, 1942, the expected large-scale attack at El Alamein began. For a total of five hours, the British shelled the German and Italian front lines on a 10-kilometre, 6 micros wide section between Bir El Atash and Bir Abu Sifai, a murderous barrage from which there was no escape. On the evening of November 2, 1942, Rommel decided to retreat the following day and radioed this intention to Germany. However, Hitler and the Führer's headquarters forbade the withdrawal, and so Rommel hesitated for another 24 hours before eventually, on November 4, he returned to his initial decision in defiance of Hitler's orders. Thus began the retreat of German and Italian troops from Egypt through Libya. My comrades and I had anxiously followed the events in Africa. Every newsreel we rooted for Rommel and his men. However, we also suspected that our side did not enjoy quite as much supply, while the British could draw on much more resources. Well, once I was promoted lieutenant, I was bursting to get back to Africa. Such was the confidence instilled by my training, such the pride after achieving an officer rank, that I, and my peers as well, believed we could turn the fortunes of war through our deployment there alone. Once we arrived at the front lines, we thought, things would go in our favour again. In the evenings when we sat together, for once, over a beer in the mess hall after training, we still reinforced each other's opinion. Well, we were more than mistaken. The situation developed quickly. In order to permanently turn the tide in Africa in favour of the Allies, British and American troops mounted an extensive landing operation on the northwest African coast, Operation Torch, on November 8, 1942. Within a short time, the Western Allies succeeded in capturing a majority of key ports from Morocco to Algeria. While these events were unfolding, I was already in Italy. Immediately after my promotion to lieutenant, we were assembled at Permesens, Germany, and transferred by rail to Naples. As with my first African deployment, we went over Brenner Pass and through South Tyrol towards Sicily. A total of five companies had been formed from Panzergrenadier Ausbildungsbataillon 104 at Landau as replacements for 15. Panzer Division at El Alamein. Each company was led by two officers. The first was the company commander, with the other leading first platoon, while at the same time being second in command. As a newly commissioned lieutenant, I took over an infantry platoon with Captain Riedel as my company commander. 
Riedel was just barely older than myself, but had already gained some experience in fierce battles at the Russian front. Upon arrival in Naples, we were temporarily quartered in Italian barracks. Here, we did not yet notice much of the unfavourable war developments in northwest Africa. The Italian officers and soldiers present kept things running as if in deepest peace. Nevertheless, we did not remain idle, conducting training with our men. These training sessions were intended to serve our forthcoming deployment and were therefore treated very seriously by the soldiers. In total, my infantry platoon, including myself, consisted of 36 men, also see the list in the appendix. The three infantry groups each comprised a group leader, his second in command, two machine gun teams with a gunner and loader each, and four riflemen. To lead these three groups, I had a platoon command squad available, which consisted of the platoon squad leader, simultaneously my deputy commander, three messengers and a medic for first aid. As for armament, my platoon had six 7.92 Plemi MG, 42 machine guns and 29 standard issue 8mm car, 98k carbines. I carried a 9mm MP40 submachine gun. Being an officer, I also carried a 7.65mm Sauer 1938H pistol. Out of all these guns, the six MGs were the most important. Their high rate of fire of up to 1,500 rounds per minute made them fearsome weapons when utilised correctly. Consequently, our enemies soon gave it the nickname of Hitler's buzzsaw. I first encountered the MG-42 during reserve officer training. Compared to the older MG-34, it had significantly better performance and was easier to handle as well. One soldier termed MG Schützer 1, MG Rifleman 1, would aim and fire the weapon, while another, MG Schützer 2, was responsible for feeding in the ammunition. In addition, the latter carried a folding tripod which could be used to turn the light machine gun, LMG, into a heavy one, SMG. This stable arrangement considerably increased the gun's effective range. Leader of my command squad, as well as my right-hand man, was Sergeant Wilhelm Rupp, born in 1910 and a man of the first hour. He had been in this since the Poland campaign. We immediately got along well, and I realised that I had a very capable man supporting me. My three group leaders, Corporals Peter Klauck, first group, Otto Aust, second, and Wilhelm Hegerwald, third, were all experienced soldiers as well who had been in the military since the beginning of the war. Each of them had been at the front just like me, some of them had even fought in Poland and France. With our enlisted men, however, the situation was entirely different. Almost all of them had entered the Wehrmacht in summer 1942, just a few months ago. This was to be their first combat mission. The youngest men were just 19 years old, while the oldest, my medic, Private Joseph Hartmann, was 35. Their private professions were of all different kinds, from minor over fitter to baker, a variety of craftsmen were present. The sole professional soldier was Sergeant Rupp, my second in command. During these November days in Naples, more and more other units joined us in a short period of time. You could see how the reinforcements were coming in. Eventually, the order was given to form five so-called Feldbataillon Tunisian, Tunisia Field Battalions abbreviated Tunisian 1 to Tunisian 5, or, even shorter, T1 to T5. Each of these consisted of a staff section and five companies. Our company was assigned to T4, commanded by Captain Karl Koch. Now that it was clear that we were going to the front lines, the atmosphere grew tense. Everyone knew about the situation in Africa and it was foreseeable that many would not return home. We were to prevail or perish. Sentiments like these circulated among the men, and as it had been for millennia, the soldiers attempted to find solace on the eve of battle by drinking. There was nothing left to do shortly before our departure, and the battalion commander knew what was going to happen, and as long as things did not get out of control, he would not prevent it. Some resourceful soldiers soon acquired wine and booze. Most of all, the heavier Italian wine quickly showed its effects. For many of the men, it did not take any more than that to raise their spirits again. Such encouragement made them deal with their fate much better. The next day, on November 25th, reality quickly caught up to us. The order to redeploy was given. 
We were to fly from Naples directly to Tunisia and reinforce 10, Panzer Division there. In full gear, we were brought to the near airfield. Dozens of Ju-52 transport planes were waiting for us. Each of our platoons was assigned one aircraft. Feelings of tension rose once the engines started running and the soldiers went aboard with mixed feelings. The individual planes, each of them loaded to the brim, formed a line and rolled towards the runway. Soon it was our turn. The pilots markedly revved up the engines and we rose up into the air lumberingly. The weather over the sea was bad and we were shaken pretty well. Nonetheless, after some time in the air, I wandered forward to our two pilots and spent some time looking over their shoulder. The cockpit offered a beautiful view. I could observe other Ju-52 zooming in formation just 50 to 100 metres, 55-110 YDs, above the water. This low altitude was necessary to reduce the possibility of British interceptors spotting us. Most of all, British Bowfighter long-range fighter aircraft wreaked havoc among our cumbersome transports. The lone gunner and his MG sitting in our aircraft would have hardly any chance of fending them off. While thinking about this, I was unnerved by the fact that I could not see any fighters of our own accompanying us. I attempted to ask the pilots about it, but they just shook their heads. All in all, I was glad about flying in bad weather. This way British interceptors would have a hard time spotting us. All of a sudden the pilots started to discuss something, gesturing wildly and a little later one of them pointed towards the middle engine. It stuttered for a bit before the propeller blades slowed down until they were just rotating in the wind. Now things got dicey, for a normally laden Ju-52, a single failing engine was not necessarily a big deal, but we were overloaded and the weather was all but good. The co-pilot turned towards me and signalled that we were to divert in the direction of Sicily. I nodded knowingly, even though I had not a clue what exactly was going on. When I wanted to turn back around, he dragged me close to him and yelled into my ear that we should throw anything overboard that could help make the craft lighter. I nodded and signalled my understanding. What was clear to me, however, was that an emergency ditching would in all likelihood mean the death of us all. Either we would die in the crash or drown in the stormy sea. I returned to my men and made them understand that we would land in Sicily due to technical problems. I could see in their faces how their fear of crashing was greater than their joy about not having to go into combat so soon. The plane turned left, following a course towards Sicily. The gunner opened the side door via its emergency handle, and in short order most of our equipment went overboard. The MG ammunition boxes were the very first to sink to the bottom of the ocean. In this flurry of activity, through the roaring airstream, one of my NCOs screamed a question toward me about whether we were to jump off the plane as well. I looked at him, utterly dumbfounded. Immediately I shook my head, and morale among the men improved somewhat. I signalled to the pilots that we had thrown everything away. The other planes vanished from sight, and after just a short while the coast of Sicily and the inner countryside became clearly visible. We soon spotted an airfield. I took a sigh of relief. My men, too, were visibly relieved, patting each other's shoulders in joy. After one preliminary traffic circuit, we touched the airstrip with a gentle bump and climbed out of the craft. Now, for the time being, it was time to wait. The pilots, along with some airfield technicians, warily inspected the engine. After some screw-driving and knocking, they seemed satisfied and let the engine be. In the meantime, darkness had set in, so continuing the journey was out of the question, and we accommodated ourselves for the coming night. We had landed at Trapani on the western tip of Sicily, and the few existing shelters were overloaded thanks to countless redeploying German troops. Thus we accommodated ourselves in quite a Spartan fashion. The next day we were assigned to another formation of Ju-52 transports. At Euro 7's hour we went up into the air and joined the convoy. Along with around 50 other Ju 52s, we managed to complete the trip to Africa without any further complications. Shortly before our arrival, Tunis had been bombarded by the Americans. Consequently, some of our aircraft had trouble landing due to the high number of bomb craters. 
On November 26, 1942, I set foot on African soil once again after almost 13 months. This time, I was an officer responsible for the lives of 35 men under my command. We had landed in Tunis, however, while the rest of our unit had been brought to Bizert. As such, there was some confusion as to what to do with me and my platoon. There was a general atmosphere of rushing as if the Americans were right at our doorstep and the landed troops were transported off the airfield without delay. Communication with Captain Coke or Captain Riedel was not possible for me. They had entered the front lines immediately after their arrival at Bizert. After some back-and-forth discussion and me explaining our situation, someone took things into their hands, and a paratrooper sergeant who coordinated the moving of airborne units out of the airfield gave me a marching order. We were to move into the Marshal Foch barracks in Tunis via truck in order to join the paratroopers of Lieutenant Colonel Koch of Fallschirmjäger Regiment 5, who coincidentally had the same name as my battalion commander. Two Opel Blitz trucks and a Kubelwagen were quickly made available to us. We mounted up and the journey continued. Soon after the outskirts of Tunis came into view. Upon arriving in the barracks we were immediately taken in and I was told that we were now effectively attached to the paratroopers. There was also a mission just for us. An attack was planned to commence in a few days, where our new unit would join the ten. Panzer Division in advancing from the Jededa area towards Taburba. On the day of our arrival, the Americans had almost reached Tunis coming from Jededa and Taburba. This threat was now to be neutralised. All available forces were being brought forward for the counter-attack. We spent the next day in these barracks, during which I received additional details about the attack, which was scheduled for December 1st, 1942, in a short briefing. The plan was as follows. The Americans and British were to be attacked at Teburba from both flanks as well as the front. 10. Panzer Division from the north at Chuigi Pass, Kampfgruppe Lueda and Kampfgruppe Hudel, two battle groups, and paratroopers of Fallschirmjäger Regiment 5, Kampfgruppe Koch, from the south at El Batan. These pincer movements were to facilitate an encirclement of the Allied forces around Teburba. A fourth combined German formation, Kampfgruppe Jededa, was to also attack Allied positions west of Jededa one day later, December 2nd. These simultaneous attacks and the resulting encirclement leading to the destruction of Allied forces were to relieve the pressure on Tunis itself. Our departure towards the front lines was scheduled for the next day already. Before that, I tried my best to gather additional information for my NCOs and soldiers, Nothing is worse than being an uninformed soldier. Before you know the wildest rumours are spread, the men feel left in the dark and become uneasy. I wanted to avoid that and give them the impression that they knew what was going on at the front lines. Up-to-date reports and information made them feel like they are living in the situation and thus are not helplessly subject to large-scale developments. Trust in one's superiors could make the difference between success and failure in combat. This was instilled in me at Wunsdorf Panzer Forces Academy, and I had witnessed the meaning of this sentiment on my first missions in Africa, 1941. In the Marshal Foch barracks we stocked up on ammunition from German supply transports, while also treating ourselves to some hand grenades. Eventually everything was done, and after a wakeful night and some final preparations, we left the barracks at noon on November 28th. Soon we arrived at Jededa. I reported to the local command post and was briefed by a major. The paratroopers in this area had been subject to intense pressure over the last few days, so we were to reinforce them until our attack would commence. Once I had an overview of the situation, I was informed of the mission envisioned for me and my men during the coming offensive. We were to immediately redeploy to the first lines at Jededa and get ready. While the flanking manoeuvres were to start on December 1st, due to the greater distance between opposing forces, we were to wait for one additional day and then initiate the frontal assault as spearhead of the combined forces of Battle Group Jededa on December 2nd. On hearing that, I had to swallow nervously. The British had been in their positions for several days, which meant their foxholes had been fortified and expanded, heavy weapons and MGs positioned and, most likely, artillery brought forward and ranged in. 
The Major had used a map during my briefing, which allowed me to get a better understanding of the terrain west of Jededa. The map located the British around three kilometres to mere west of the town on a low hill. Our positions lay opposed to them in a shallow basin, which meant that our assault on the British would go uphill. All this went through my head within seconds. As the Major stated, our combined forces of battle group Jededa in essence comprised two infantry march battalions, a mixed armoured company of ten. Panzer Division, Luftwaffe AA units with 20mm and 88mm guns, and finally the paratroopers that were already stationed in the furthermost lines. 10. Panzer Division, among their more common German Panzer III tanks, also had a new type of vehicle available, the Panzer VI Tiger, later called Tiger I. What the Major promised me was a preliminary bombardment by our own artillery, which would soften up British positions right before the attack. This gave me some reassurance. We would not have to run up against the British completely unprepared. Nevertheless, would this assault mean forlorn hope for me and my platoon, posing an enormous challenge for my inexperienced young soldiers? On the way back to my men, I thought about our options. I assembled the soldiers and described the situation as well as our mission to them. From the faces of the more experienced NCOs, I immediately noticed that they were judging the situation the same way I did. I emphasised the preliminary artillery strike. Tensely the men listened to me. Many probably could not begin to imagine what this attack could mean for them. Inwardly, I first thought to myself that most likely some would not survive this attack, Indeed, perhaps I myself could be dead soon. I banished the thought and tried to present our mission as clearly as possible. In closing, I announced that I would determine the detailed plan of attack on the spot later in the field. The NCOs nodded in agreement, and I was relieved by this feedback. I had their support. This was essential to make it through the assault. By foot, we marched on into our designated combat zone, which we arrived at shortly before darkness set in. On our way, we could see the damage caused by the American armoured offensive and the resulting fighting around Jededa. We reached the edge of a grove of eucalyptus and olive trees spreading over a large portion of the area ahead. There we were received by a platoon of paratroopers. As dusk had already passed, we joined them in their positions, resolving to take over our own positions the next day. Before I went to sleep, the paratroopers told me how they had to endure fierce fighting against the Americans and British. Two days before, November 26th, they had come close to being destroyed by the American armoured spearhead. However, they had also been able to destroy a few tanks in turn. The next morning, I had my first look at the surrounding terrain accompanied by the paratrooper platoon commander. The Fallschirmjäger already knew the place quite well, leading me on a tour through our positions. The terrain was much like I had surmised. Our positions were essentially on, or directly next to, a tiny ridge roughly two kilometres, 1.2 palmains west of Jedida. Around 600 metres, 660 tamdo ahead, another ridge rose up, behind which the British had dug in. This was our objective. Between these features, in a shallow depression, was a vast grove of eucalyptus and olive trees. It had been planted artificially, such that all the trees were neatly arranged in parallel rows. This resulted in long swathes of open ground leading across the field. To the left, the grove was bordered by a railroad track and the Mejderda River. To the right lay the road leading from Jededa towards Teburba, along which the American tanks had advanced a few days ago, forcing our paratroopers into the woods. In the process, eight German Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks had been disabled. These were crucial losses that were now sorely needed in the upcoming attack. The eucalyptus trees had been completely tousled by the fighting. I counted a total of 15 tree rows going north from the railroad. Among these trees, the paratroopers had dug their positions. Before their foxholes still lay some dead, British and German soldiers that were killed during the initial skirmishes. In a small ditch, a hidden place for the wounded was concealed by some twigs. There, a wounded British soldier lay as well. He had been captured during one of the attacks and it seemed that he thought this to be his last day. 
Impassively, he lay below the branches. When I bent down to him, he looked at me with tired eyes. The paratrooper commander explained to me that they had planned to bring the man behind the lines after my unit had taken over. Interrogation of another captured British soldier had revealed that our opponents were part of 2nd Battalion, Royal Hampshire Regiment. Just like us, they had been brought up to the front lines recently. In another place cleared for the wounded which we visited, British and German soldiers were sitting next to each other in togetherness. Until noon we had relieved the paratroopers, who assembled in our rear. I wished them well and hoped to see them again during the planned attack. My runners had contact with the command post further back, and we were now on our own. Just when I wanted to get some rest, several dull bangs could be heard, and moments later the first shells detonated in front of our positions. The explosions quickly drew closer. Our arrival and relief seemed to have been noticed. We put our heads down inside the foxholes and were grateful that the paratroopers had already dug them. While the detonations drew closer, I could hear the characteristic hum of shrapnel cutting through the air, and the trees around us had to endure the storm. Pieces of wood and leaves rippled down on us. A short while later the action was over again. I sent out my runners and was very relieved to receive note that we had suffered no casualties. I then personally inspected our positions and convinced myself of this. Leaves and twigs littered the floor everywhere. All soldiers were in good spirits, although it was apparent that this first attack had left them full of adrenaline. For many, this had been their baptism by furs and they looked at me eyes wide open. However, the attack let my men make another discovery. While visiting one of the foxholes, a soldier pointed towards a body lying roughly 50 metres, 55 YDs, ahead. One of the men had observed this body moving during the artillery strike. I guessed that it was a wounded Englishman lying in no man's land. Just as I wanted to go ahead and take a look, there was more rushing and whistling in the air above, and we were forced back into our foxholes. An intense smell of powder and eucalyptus filled the air. I decided to wait until dusk before looking for the Englishman. The trees offered not enough cover to move out undetected. In the evening, once another British bombardment seemed unlikely, me and two other soldiers, my medic being one of them, cautiously went forward. On the approach we could already see that, just as surmised, it was a wounded British soldier. Carefully we moved closer to the Tommy, as we jokingly called the British back then. His faint rattle showed that he was seriously wounded. I bent over to him very slowly so as not scare him. He looked at me, eyes wide open, his mouth stained with blood, and I could see a large wound in his chest that let out foamy blood with each rattling breath he took. A bullet or a piece of shrapnel must have hit his lung. The Englishman whimpered softly, his eyes begging from deep inside his already pale face. I took his hand, squeezed it firmly, and said in English, We will help you. We will bring you to the field hospital. He moaned faintly and squeezed my hand back a bit to signify that he understood. My medic, Private Hartman, bandaged him provisionally, and together we brought him back to our positions, covering each other's movements. Once there, I gave orders to make sure the Englishman would be brought to the next assembly point for the wounded in the rear. My medic and a few other soldiers picked him up and carried him to the rear. To this day I do not know whether he survived. I very much hope so. He was not much older than my young soldiers. The night from November 29th to November 30th went by without further events, but the next morning we were greeted by yet another artillery strike. This time the shells struck significantly closer to our positions. They had to have an observer in the area to direct the guns. I could not see any other explanation. It was past time to do something about that. I sent my runners to the rear, requesting our own artillery strike focused on the single house, and indeed support was granted, not by artillery fire, however. Instead, several Luftwaffe soldiers towing a 20mm AA cannon arrived at noon, which they set up on the small hill behind us. They began firing at the house with explosive and tracer ammunition. I also told one of my MGs to fire at will, so we let loose a few bursts of fire towards the building. 
The first salvos already struck the target, and smoke emerging from the house indicated that it had started to burn. The Luftwaffe soldiers fired a few more salvos before withdrawing with their cannon. For a while I kept looking at the house through my binoculars, but nothing seemed to happen. Well, I may have been right, because the afternoon went by calmly, and there were no more artillery strikes. It was only a day later that another artillery strike forced us deep into our foxholes. This was the fourth time, and it was more intense than the ones before. Almost like a miracle, none of my soldiers had been wounded by all these British shells, and especially in woodlands, artillery could be terribly effective, where shells with impact fuses could hit a tree and thus detonate above ground. We had been lucky, however, even though this last attack showered us not only in leaves and branches, but also chunks of earth and rocks. It was just a matter of time until the British shells would strike home. At some point, our luck would run out, that we all knew. The night before December 1st was also quiet, and the morning greeted us with another British artillery strike. These recurring attacks slowly wore my men down, and I enjoyed the thought that we would leave our positions the following morning even though the reason for that was our assault. Still, better to make a move than having to bear one artillery strike after the other. Around noon the paratroopers arrived, and we went through the mission details together. Tomorrow morning, December 2, 1942, at U7, Waro, I was to assault the British positions on the other side of the ridge after a preliminary bombardment. The paratroopers of Battle Group Koch wanted to execute the decisive advance on Elbathan further south. Once the paratroopers had departed in the evening, I gave some final orders. I went through all the details again, trying to convey trust and conviction. Finally, everyone returned to their positions, and it was time to wait for dawn. This would be my first real assault, and I was responsible for a whole platoon to boot. My head was full of thoughts about this and that, going through all our options time and again. What if our artillery did not fire? What if enemy defensive fire caused heavy casualties and we were halted right in front of their positions, pinned down without any way around? So many questions that I could not answer. I lay in my foxhole in the fading heat of the day, contemplating the coming attack and what it might spell for us. In the early morning hours, when I had just caught a little sleep, a shot suddenly whipped through the night. I startled up immediately. The men of my platoon command squad, who had their foxholes right next to mine, were wide awake as well. Just like me, they had been barely able to sleep. I sent out the runners to check all our positions and find out what had happened. After a short time, I knew it. Disaster had struck. One rifleman of 3rd Squad, 30-year-old Georg Siegel, had ventured too far away from his foxhole and on his return was shot by one of his comrades. I rushed to the squad. There he lay, a bullet hole in his chest, already dead. His squad's commander, Sergeant Hegewald, was distraught and wanted to find out how it could have happened. Still in shock, the rifleman who had fired tried to explain how he had seen a figure approach his foxhole from the front, thinking it was part of a British reconnaissance patrol. What Rifleman Siegel was doing in front of our line, we did not know. Perhaps he had wanted to relieve himself and got lost. I asked the shooter to calm down. It was not his fault. It had simply happened. I ordered Sergeant Hegerwald to calm the men down, adjuring him to not let any unrest emerge shortly before our attack. The dead man was to be put behind our line. We would retrieve his body after the assault. Hegewald nodded and I rushed back. Inside, I was aghast. Why did this have to happen just now? Was this a dire portent? Shortly before 06 Asis I ordered the alarm and we began our advance through the grove along the whole line. I wanted to take up a favourable starting position before waiting for our artillery strike. Everything went smoothly. We secured a position in a shallow ditch undetected. Quietly we hunkered in the undergrowth. I was sure everyone knew what had happened shortly before, even though nobody let it show. Now the attack was occupying their minds. The MG-42 near the railroad embankment was to cover our first advance. I wanted to move along the embankment and the swathes of trees as projected by our plan. 
Tensely we lay between the tree rows, covering all directions. I took a look at my watch. 0645, so it won't be long, I thought. All of a sudden I heard an unmistakable sound. A faint chink of tracks and vibrations in the ground heralded the approach of war machines. The engine noise came from behind us. Our panzers were on the advance. The humming of engines and metallic clank of tracks in their bogey wheels grew louder and louder, until suddenly the first tank appeared on the railroad embankment. A German Panzer III, as I expertly recognised, behind it another. But what kind of monstrosity was among them? It had to be a tiger. It was almost twice the size of a Pez III, and its wide tracks lumbered along on both sides of the railroad track. In the lead vehicle, I could spot a head with headphones sticking out of the turret hatch. I moved a bit out of the protective undergrowth and held my MP40 up high. With a jolt, the panzer came to a halt, and the tank commander raised his hand as well. The panzer directly behind him kept going for a bit, while the tiger came down from the embankment, closing up to the leading vehicle. It now stood in a shallow ditch that offered some cover, its engine chugging along, its fearsome 88mm gun menacingly pointed in our direction. I could feel my adrenaline level rising. Looking at my men's faces, I recognised guarded joy stemming from the unexpected arrival of these tanks. Again I looked at my watch, just before 07 Bialao. Now all that was left was for our artillery to keep its promise and fire in time. And indeed, muffled bangs sounded, and just like that shells whizzed over our heads. A mushroom cloud rose from the hillside before us, and then another right next to it. But I immediately realised, they're firing too short. Shell upon shell now detonated ahead of us on the hill. Not on the ridge or shortly behind it, however, where the British had their positions. I counted twelve impacts, then the show stopped. So that was all the ammunition they had in stock for us. Behind us, the engines roared up, and I gave the sign to attack. I gripped my submachine gun, and we swarmed the grove in a line formation, staying close to the ground. We took the first twenty yards, sixty yards, to our left, one of the Panzer III's ground along the railroad on top of the embankment. I was animating the men, and we had almost reached the ridge when all of a sudden hell broke loose. A machine gun rattled directly ahead, projectiles whizzed past us, bangs of small arms fire filled the air. Next to me, one of my men slumped down, in front of me another was carried off his feet. Enemy bullets tore through our ranks, we dropped prone, gasping for air. I looked at the panzers. The leading panzer three jolted to a halt, its hatches swung open, and its crew dropped out onto the ground. At hit, it crossed my mind. The second Panzer III now started firing, while the Tiger was still standing in its ditch. All of that happened in mere seconds. Impacts around me brutally put me back into my own situation. Enemy fire intensified. We were almost on top of the ridge, our enemies behind it. Crossing the ridge seemed impossible to me. Their fire was too intense. I yelled at my men around me, pointing towards the embankment. We had to reach it and take cover there. Two of my MGs opened fire, and we threw ourselves towards the embankment. While I was running, I was looking around. We were around 25 men left, which meant that I had lost around 10 men already. One or two more leaps later we reached the embankment. I felt the hot whizzing of projectiles flying past us. With a shriek, one of my soldiers, a runner, fell to the ground. We ran past the firing pest the Thur's rear and lied down on the other side. The runner had made it as well. Blood squirted out of his upper leg and he hunched with pain. Sweat poured over my face and into my eyes. I panted, the bang of the close-by tank gun hurt in my ears. Sergeant Rupp lay down next to me. How many are left? I yelled. Almost twenty was his response. Forward, here, along the embankment, the tank will support us. I screamed and ran along the slope. The soldiers followed, some of them overturning me on the assault. Again the fire intensified, and we dropped on the slope after around 110 yards. To our left I discovered a house. Figures were emerging from it, hands up. 
Englishman. I gestured towards the rear. Without giving us any further attention, they ran back. Directly ahead, I saw a culvert in the embankment, perhaps a dried-out irrigation canal between the river and the eucalyptus and olive grove. Something was moving in the culvert. It seemed to be a wounded Englishman. Apparently, we were now on a level with the British positions on the far hillside. I sent one of my men to capture him. Carefully, the former approached him, upon which the Englishman suddenly drew his carbine and shot him in the belly. The bullet went out of his back, and my soldier dropped to the side. I yelled at the next man, Hand grenade! He understood, readied one, pulled the pin, and threw it into the culvert. With a dull bang, it exploded. I raised my MP40 to get the men's attention, but all of a sudden, stinging pain flashed through my lower right arm. The MP40 dropped to the ground and I gazed at my arm. I was shocked to see blood dripping out of my sleeve. Apparently, I had been shot through my lower arm. A shell detonated close by. Shrapnel whizzed above our heads. It seemed that we were being targeted by cannon fire. Perhaps the AT guns that had taken out our panzer. We hunkered into the slope. Suddenly, it was as if the embankment was torn apart to my left. I was sprayed with rocks and chunks of dirt. Almost the same instant Sergeant Rupp bumped into me, burying me under him. Almost stunned, I pushed him away with my left and I lost my breath. A shell had struck right next to us. Sergeant Rupp bore the brunt of the shrapnel and his body had protected mine. What had landed on me were his mutilated remains. His right side was unrecognisable. Everywhere blood streamed out of his torn-up body. We had to move away if we wanted to survive. I looked around. We were no more than ten to twelve men. With my left hand, I drew my pistol, looked to my left and right and yelled, Assault! Forward! I dragged myself up, and together with what was left of my platoon, I advanced over the railroad embankment towards the British positions ahead. With one leap, we left the embankment behind. The first British foxholes appeared ahead. Inside them, British soldiers, unmistakable thanks to the flat steel helmets on their heads. They were pointing their weapons at us, bayonets fixed. I screamed in English, Hands up! Come on, hands up! and ran towards them, my pistol drawn up to them. The first Englishmen dropped their guns and raised their arms. I slowed down. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw how right next to me, in front of one of my men, an Englishman yanked up his hands and my man shot him with his carbine. Realising his mistake, my soldier immediately lowered his rifle. Suddenly I saw movement. Less than three yards away, an Englishman drew a bead on me with his bayoneted rifle. I raised my pistol, and in the same moment I felt an impact in my lower body. I could see the recoil pushing the Englishman's shoulder back. Tumbling forward I shot at him multiple times. The bullets hit his body. He collapsed, burying his rifle under him. I fell on him. I had been hit again that I could feel, but I was not in pain. I rolled to the side and dragged myself to sit up. My pistol, it turned out, was emptied. The rest of my platoon assembled around me. I saw only a few soldiers. Where are my other men? I thought. Where is my platoon? Things went quiet. The shooting had ended. We had almost wiped each other out. Two-thirds of my platoon were either dead or wounded, with myself being severely wounded by shots through my lower arm and hip. This had been the price of this assault. My medic, Private Hartman, who had made it unharmed in whatever way, leaned towards me. I wanted to stand up, but he gently pushed me to the ground. He gestured towards two Englishmen, and together they picked me up and supported me. I ordered my men to bring the captured Tommies to the rear and secure our new positions. Then I commenced the march back with Hartman, the lightly wounded, and our prisoners. We arrived at our staging area. There a vehicle, a customised Opal P4, was ready to transport the wounded. I was not yet ready to leave, however. I indicated to one of the British that I wanted my coat picked up, which I had left behind before the assault. I took off my steel helmet and donned my uniform cap. Then I took my camera out of the coat, showed the Englishman how to use it, and asked him to take a picture of us. 
The man gave me a puzzled look at first, but then bunched us together and took the picture. The resulting photograph shows a group of people who, just minutes ago, had wanted to kill each other and were now standing in togetherness. After taking the picture, I was loaded into the Opal P4, and together with two other wounded from my platoon, as well as my two Tommies, we went to the medic station. Now, in the car, the adrenaline subsided and the pain started. My trousers and my sleeve were full of blood. In the arm, it seemed that no bones had been hit, but my hip was hurting immensely. With my lips pressed against each other, I made it through the ride. My two British prisoners looked at me compassionately, without hatred. The British soldiers asked me whether they would now become German prisoners of war, POWs. I said no, since in Africa Allied POWs were principally handled by the Italians. They looked saddened and asked if we could maybe make an exception for them. Despite the pain, this request made me smirk. Again I declined and told them that in Africa there was only Italian imprisonment. The car rumbled along and the pain made my forehead sweaty. The pain became unbearable. In the Tunis hospital I was treated professionally. The arm wound was a clean penetration between ulna and radius. Things were worse with my hip wound. The bullet had entered my groin and exited on the other side. The wound was sanitized and I got a cast to remain absolutely still. The pain did not subside, however, and after a few days, the wound began festering. The doctors realized that there was little to do about it here in Africa. Consequently, I was to be brought back to Europe. I was also told that our offensive had been successful, with all objectives reached by December 3. The Americans and British only barely managed to escape complete destruction. On the battlefield, they left 134 destroyed tanks, most of them from the regiments of the American 1st Armoured Division. When my belongings were packed, I was directly handed my German-Italian dictionary and paybook. I quickly saw why. Both had been in my trousers' back pocket, and now they both had a small hole. The bullet that had penetrated my hip had also passed through both booklets on its way out. It was not only those that had been damaged, however, but also the photograph of my beloved Helena, which I had put inside the paybook, had a bullet hole. On December 7, 1942, I was brought to Tunis Airfield. Other wounded were put next to me, until the plane was eventually full. The doors were shut, and before I knew it, the aircraft took off. Pain in my hip was still enormous, and I could barely move with that cast. Africa had not kept me for long this time. Just a few days, and I was already on my way back home. 